episode covering the Olympic virtual series. Joined today by an Olympic superstar, Australia's Anna Mears. Welcome, Anna. Hello, thank you for having me. <laughs> nice to have you here. And as, as always, just kind of just set the scene on this. Six Olympic medals, um, 11 world titles, plus a bunch of other very interesting stuff that we'll come on to. So in a very accomplished um, cyclist and sportswoman. Um, but I read recently, Anna, your, your, most, you know, your, your number one achievement is not on a bike. Definitely not. Um, like you said, I've had a great deal of success in my career. My career spanned uh, almost 24 years um, from the day I picked up a bike to the day I, I hung it up, but I spent 16 years at the elite senior level. But um, retiring in my early to mid 30s, um, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to get the chance to experience a family and be a mum and I'm really really excited that at the age of 37 I have a beautiful daughter Evelyn who's now 15 months and I'm expecting my second bubby in October this year so wow. yeah better than it thank you better better than any title or any medal I've ever won so lovely and your your second do you know boy or girl you're going to find out the sex? Uh, I want to, but my partner Nick is all about the surprise. <laughs> and we did the surprise for Evelyn, um, and it was really exciting. And the second time around, I thought, ah, oh, we can find out this time, but he's all for the surprise. And I can't put myself under pressure for nine months to not let slip. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not going to find out. Yeah. Well, I say congratulations on the... Uh, on, the, on the second one as well, and they, obviously life-changing in so many ways. But uh, today, Anna, we're obviously going to talk a lot about cycling and, and the Olympics. And many of our guests will be listening to the podcast during a group ride. Um, but what? Oh, how excited are you, Anna, for the Olympic virtual series? Obviously, it's new, um, and you're involved. Yeah, very excited. Uh, the virtual series, in, in particular, the virtual cycling platforms. Um, reignited my passion for cycling. Um, after 24 years, like most people, when you retire from a profession, it's almost the last thing you want to do <laughs> in retirement. Yeah. And, um, you know, I didn't even unpack my bike for a good 12 to 18 months after I retired from Rio in 2016. And, um, you know, just jumping on bikes, riding to the coffee shop with mates was even hard because my car was sitting in the carport. And I'm like, well, I can just get in the car and have the banter and the coffee and come home. I just couldn't find the recreational love of riding. And it was my teammate, Graham Brown, from my first Olympics in Athens, um, who's a, you know, loves the online platforms. And he just tested me to try his whip. And it was the first time I tried virtual cycling. And as a new mum, it was really good for me to be able to, you know, kind of ride half dressed. <laughs> not having to get completely in my cycling gear and I could um, pedal when my daughter was having a nap whether it be 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, whatever she would give me. Um, it was my little escape and my little endorphin release that I that I got and um, now that the Olympic virtual series is happening it's very exciting because this is a whole new thing for me as well. Amazing. I could can, I can, I can picture you Anna and me and my wife Danny do the same thing. Well, I'm, I'm, we're cycling away indoors, and we've got our baby monitor on the handlebars, <laughs> and you're just praying they don't wake up. Yeah, because you're like 5k from getting a, um, a badge, like collecting all those yeah. little things that you can on the platform. So, um, no, it, it did wonders for my mental health, it did wonders for my physical health as well, and actually got me back to being, you know, wanting to get outdoors and being physically active outdoors again. Yeah. Um, I like to ride an e-bike these days, and no, it's not cheating. <laughs> I agree, yeah. I agree. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I still like to tap into that virtual platform. Yeah, awesome. And that's one thing, indoor training and virtual cycling just allows people to be, yeah, yeah keep, keep more active, um, stay fitter because of the time efficiency of it. Um, ideal for parents. Um, so yeah, it's just, just amazing. I think it's, once, it's one of those things, once you get into the routine of training indoors and embracing uh, virtual cycling, virtual sports, it just becomes part of your routine. Um, it would be so easy, I mean, you, you said about it, you had 18 months where you didn't really get on the bike because of that obstacle. You know, it's quite, it takes a long time, a lot of effort. Indoors, virtually, 
a lot, lot easier to do, of course. Yeah, and, and I was a sprinter in my heyday, so, you know, we kind of melted in the rain and we didn't go out in bad weather and we always went with a tailwind. <laughs> so to take those elements that kind of, you know, disenga not disencourage people from jumping on a bike outdoors, especially during COVID when lockdowns hit, um, it yep. really was an escape and, and like when you get out on a bike on the road and you kind of get lost in the environment, you really can get lost in the environment um, on the virtual platforms as well, but it's still really social because thousands of people are doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. You just mentioned there, uh, obviously, sprinting is your thing. That vital statistic, I've got to ask you, peak power. <laughs> what would you do, Anna? People, can be, people always want to know that type of stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, I just want to remind you before I say this that I'm retired, okay? Because when I'm on these virtual <laughs> platforms, people always ask me, oh, do you want to go for a sprint? It's only 10 seconds. I'm like, no, I'm retired. Um, yeah, don't. <laughs> but at my best, um, my peak power was 1,800 watts. Um, wow. Yeah, which is... Yeah, you know, I didn't hit it that often because uh, as a sprinter, like you said, for, for me to be fit, I need to be strong. I don't I didn't ride kilometre after kilometre because that essentially detrained a fast twitch we were trying to achieve in the gym. And sure. it also shrunk down the muscle mass, which I needed to be able to produce that power. And, um, you know, the, the coaches kind of, if I was a, a, as an athlete, I was a spring, the coaches just compress and compress and load and load and load you as a spring. And you only get to play with the full scope of that, you know, power that comes from releasing that spring once or twice in, in an Olympic season. So um, it was really fun when they let me have full reign of whatever engine they built in the four year Olympic cycle. There's a lot of trust going on there. Not to say they're compressing and compressing that spring and you're, you're buying into it. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden you taper, and that spring doesn't release. Yeah. <laughs> Very you know? frustrating. It's um, Very frustrating. It takes huge trust in the team that you work with as an Olympic athlete. You know, um, I often say to people that, and I, and I like to show people a video montage of some of the training I did for the Olympics because it's a chance for them to look behind the curtain. They, they might get it. They might see us once every four years on the velodrome, you know, doing 65, 70 k's an hour, winning Olympic medals. But behind the scenes, it's a hard slog. It's a battle physically, mentally, and emotionally. And you've got to trust that the coach's plans, you've got to buy into the strategy, you've got to understand the big picture so that you can focus on the small puzzle pieces to make sure that it fits in the right places by the time the Olympics come around at the end of the four-year cycle. Um, I was an individual athlete, but I really was much part of a much larger team, and I relied on my team immensely for the success that I had. Yeah, very, very interesting. Just, just touching on your training then, Anna. How much gym did you did you do? And I, and I guess the other, other interesting angle is from the start of your career to the end of the career. Did that change as kind of the learnings about sports science and your yeah? Yeah, did it did. It did change significantly. Um, you know, when I started, I was 11 years of age. Um, I worked with a great coach called Reg Tucker, who was really wonderful at building the foundation required for mm -hmm. um, being involved in an Olympic sport. Um, it wasn't all about the physical at that stage. It was a lot more about um, mental capacity, understanding race tactics, knowing where you got to position yourself, how to, you know, um, survive essentially. Um, and then when I kind of got picked up from there to the national program, a good example of my first gym session was that my max squat weight that I lifted at 60 kilograms was the warm up weight for the girls in the national program. <laughs> so mm, I was wow. significantly behind in terms of um, physical strength when I, I was selected into the national team at the age of 19. And I remember the coach, the first thing he did was put me on the scales. Um, which for most people is a pretty daunting thing because you expect the, the coach is going to say, right, we're going to put you on a nutrition plan, we need you to lose weight, all this sort of stuff. But he <laughs> he just looked at my weight and he said, you need to eat much more food. <laughs> yes! Yeah, so it's... <laughs> Dream! It's a, it's a really interesting area to be a part of, like a strength power-based sport because it's, it's all about... Um, quality over quantity and it's all about ensuring that the engine can function at its best capacity um, you know having that, that really good functional muscle mass um, is really important um, and then the training kind of works around that so 
I went from doing maybe half an hour of gym a week to doing nine hours of gym a week. <laughs> nine hours of gym a week? Wow, yeah. that is eye-opening. Yeah. That is incredible. And volume on the road, obviously you're not going out and doing five-hour <laughs> rides like, like, the, like the endurance guys, but you do spend some time on a road bike, I'm presuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So kind of if I could break it down in a week, um, I might do three gym sessions at three hours a piece. I might, might do four track sessions at four hours a piece. I'll throw in an ergo session in there as well. Um, this is over a six day period with the seventh day off of course. And in between those sessions, we would use the road to recover from the damage we would cause to our muscles. So I would never really ride more than maybe 30, uh, uh, 30, 30 to 60 kilometers, which would take me between an hour and two hours. I'd sit at about 27 k's an hour um, with a cadence of roughly about you know 99 to 110 to just make those muscles move um, a little more sure. than what you know probably road riders would sit between 80 and 90 rpm um, mm -hmm. on their road rides. So um, the longest ride I did by the time I, I retired was about 80 k. And uh, Steve wow. Steve War, who's one of our great cricketing captains of Australia, asked me to do his charity ride. Um, and it was 700 and something kilometers in six days. And I was petrified and he couldn't understand why I was so petrified. Yeah. And the first day was 150K. I had never ridden that far in my life. And no. oh, I slept well that night. <laughs> e-bike, e take, take your e-bike. <laughs> Hadn't come across e-bikes at that stage. <laughs> oh, damn it. So just so, so three hour gym session, obviously that's three hours in the gym, um, so obviously a lot of that is spent resting. Um, yes. So is it? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, so a road ride then, so you went out for like a two hour road ride, spent two hours in the calf, <laughs> for about four hour, four, hour, four hour road ride. Uh, well, Shabby it, time, It's kit it. time, isn't it? Yes, it's kit time. So, kit time. Um, yeah, you're, you're very right. Um, in a four hour track session, I might get between four and six efforts out, you know, and, and that's sure. what I mean about quality. You spend, you know, 20, 30 minutes on your warm up, um, then you have a rest and you want to do a maximal effort when it comes time to that effort but you're, the training allows you to hurt yourself physically so quickly that you need between 20 and 30 minutes to recover to repeat that. There's no point um, repeating efforts if you can't maintain a certain standard or improve as the session goes on. Um, so I like to try and explain to people that your endurance athletes try to push out that lactic buffer. They don't, you know, they train to ensure that they don't feel that lactic acid um, too quickly in their efforts. Uh, whereas track sprinters really engage that system quickly. We want to feel the lactic acid burn, and that becomes an additional fuel source for us. Which is why you'll see the guys on the track do a one-kilometer time trial, or, or the women doing 500 meters and literally can't walk when they get off the bike. They're, the muscles yeah. have swelled an inch in the legs because the lactic acid has just is just pumping through the muscles. Which is why yeah. I'm really excited because this Olympic virtual series, and the workouts that I've chosen um, are replicating the, the team sprint. Um, so people are going to get an idea of the pain that such a short effort can cause and the requirement of such a big rest. Um, and you'll also find that that will have an impact on the days following as well. I think you may just put some uh, put some riders off trying your session. No, it's, it's really fun. Scared them. It's real. Uh, honestly, <laughs> it's see, it scares me to think that I've got to sit on a bike for three or four hours sometimes. So I'd rather just like do yeah. a mad hit out for 10, 20 yeah. seconds and be done. You know, it's, that's the thing that impresses me about sprinters. This is just that ability to go that deep, mm. like endurance athletes can't exert themselves over 10-15 seconds to, to make themselves physically sick. You can't, physically can't do it. They haven't got the, the fibres to do it. Whereas a track sprinter, yeah, the way you can just turn it on, give literally 100%. Impressive, very impressive. It reminds me, I used to go to um, Manchester Velodrome to watch my wife um, train when she was on the, on, on the GB squad. And they, they, those sessions would be so boring to sit inside and, and watch. Because <laughs> there'd be hard anything going on. Yeah. You all sit, sit down in the middle chatting they finally get up here we go coming up for a big effort and they do like half a lap effort or something it's like oh, oh they're sat back down now <laughs> yeah it's um we often have a lot of um banter between our endurance and sprint squads as to the you know yeah. the that you're better athlete <laughs> yeah because the perception is the more riding you do the fitter you are um but like you said it's just it's what you train your body for 
for its performance to happen. And um, yes, sprinting is boring on a training scene. But then when you flip it on race day, your enduros come out in the team pursuit and you do one team pursuit, but the sprinters have got to do 12 rounds in the sprints against six different people. Um, and so it, it kind of evens itself out, I think. Yeah, yeah, that, that, is, that is a debate that's never going to be won by anyone. That's going to be going on and on and on. But, um, I'll still try but, um, Yeah, good on you, good on you. Um, interested in so, track cycling, you know, the, the barriers to track cycling as a, as a cycling discipline, you know, not having a velodrome obviously makes it hard to be a, be a track cyclist. And in the UK, there's six indoor velodromes, obviously we're only a small island, six indoor velodromes, um, but pre-2010, we only had two. Mm. Um, and the, the, the tr tricky thing is, is p having access to a velodrome. Um, were you, again, were you born close to a velodrome or how, how did you find yourself coming to track cycling? I found myself coming to track cycling like many, many people. I was introduced to it on TV. Um, I grew up right. in uh, country Queensland, a, a regional area. We're not metropolitan, not city based at all. My father was a coal miner and Middle Mount where we lived was, had a population of 2,000 people. So um, the best thing we had was BMX track and I started cycling um, by BMX. And I only started BMX because I'm, I'm the baby of four in my family. And my mum's rule was that she wouldn't take four kids to four different sports. So the oldest, who was the only boy, he got to choose sports. <laughs> and his three little sisters had to follow suit. And the first sport he chose was BMX, um, oh. which was a great platform for both my sister Carrie and I um, to spring in springboard into track sprint cycling when in 1994, at the age of 11 and, and 12, Kerry was 12, I was 11, um, we watched Kathy Watt uh, win gold for Australia on the velodrome at the Commonwealth Games. And um, we asked mum and dad if we could try this track cycling because it looked really cool, you know. Kathy was riding on a bike painted with the Aussie flag, waving the flag above her head. And, um, <laughs> yeah, they had no idea where they were going to find it. So we have what's called like the yellow pages here, which is like your phone directory book, which probably yep, is yep. defunct now. Um, but they just looked that up for the closest club and from where we live, the closest club in Velodrome was almost 300 kilometres away. Um, wow. It was an outdoor flat bitumen circular track, 400 metres. Um, it was a great club, had a huge um, uh, juniors uh, involvement, but they were all guys, all boys. So when Kerry and I started, we were the only girls um, as young kids in cycling and then um, my parents did a two-year stint of every weekend around school. They would drive us a 600-kilometre round trip there and back for us to be able wow. to participate on the velodrome. And eventually, um, they packed us up and moved into town where there was a better velodrome in Rockhampton. Um, now, it's interesting, the two differences between my sister and I. Like, Kerry was really phenomenal, phenomenal from the get-go. She was physically more developed than I was. Um, she was better suited to track sprinting. To be honest, I sucked. Um, I was skinny, I was scrawny. Um, I was actually more suited to the road cycling um, because of my physical right. stature, but it just I just didn't have the attention span or the interest in it. And despite my love for track cycling and sprinting, I just, I, uh, I sucked. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until I was probably 16 and I filled out and matured physically that I started to be able to compete on that level but up until then like I mentioned earlier my first coach Reg Tucker just talked to me about how to race how to maneuver how where to position myself what to look for um, so by the time my body caught up my mind was already well um, shaped for reading races and reading tactics and implementing tactics so by then I, I was able to win um, my first junior world title which then gave me a bit of confidence that maybe my first Commonwealth Games could be around the corner, maybe I could get to an Olympic Games. I, I never really was loud and proud about where my goals were taking me when I was young. Um, but eventually at the age of uh, 20, I made my first Olympic Games in Athens. I deferred from uni because I thought oh, I might never get a chance like this again. Yeah. And uh, nearly 20 years later, I finally pulled the pin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. What 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 a career! Yeah. I think there's a lesson in there for young young girls, young young, young cyclists, to think or young sports people. If you're not world class as a kid, national standards as a kid, 
doesn't mean to say you can't make it. You know, you kind of really kicked on as you got a bit older. Absolutely. Um, I think that's, that's 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 the hard thing, isn't it? Sometimes you're you know you're 12 and you look around and you kind of you're very average and you think, oh, that's it. That's my dream. End of my dream. But. It's not. No, it's, it's very true. You know, kids develop physically at such different rates at different ages. Uh, it's really important. One thing I love to just kind of push on parents and kids is just follow the passion. Where there is love, mm -hmm. there will be improvement o over that time. Um, but it has to be at their time. You can't rush those things. Yeah, absolutely. And just jump it back to the Olympic virtual series, obviously, and being a role model. Do you, do, do you realise how much of a role model you are to, to people? <laughs> uh, yes, but I forget um, yeah. because I feel normal. Um, yeah. I... Which is probably a reason why you're such a role model. <laughs> so you, you, you kind of you, you level with people yeah. and you get involved in the virtual series, that type of thing. But... Yeah, no. Well, look, I really appreciate that just even on an Australian level, the public have loved my career. They've connected with me personally over a long period of time. And it's a career that's not just filled with highs. You know, you said 11 world titles, six Olympic medals. It's a career that's also filled with lows and challenges and facing adversity. And I've just tried to stay really true to myself um, in those moments. And I think by Learning how to articulate both the highs and the lows allows, allows, allowed me to bring people along uh, for the ride, so to speak, um, as I went. And the, the ride that the Olympians are on at the moment, especially with the Games being delayed a year um, due to COVID-19, um, it, it's really challenging. It's very, very tough. And, and to a lot of people, it's just sport, you know, and they're like, oh, what's another yes. three years? Just just let the let it go. But it would be like almost, I was trying to think of, of a comparison for people to understand. It would almost be like going and doing a degree at university, getting it done, waiting for the certificate, and then being told, no, 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 sorry, you're going to have to wait another four years before that chance happens. And it, but you're still going to have to pay yeah. your debts. You're still going to have to work and get keep your grades up over yeah. that four years and then come back and see if you can hold that standard again. Um, you know, these are people and athletes that dedicate their lives. And so... You know, sport in its in as a result of that really triggers the emotion in its supporters, and on just a, not just a domestic scale but international as well. And I think um, with with no fans being able to be in the stands at the Tokyo Games later this year, um, I think it's, this is you know the Olympic virtual series is a great way to interact with those fans and bring them in and into the build up of those games. Yeah, no, great. It's obviously in inclusion and participation. Mm. They're two Olympic values. Um, and obviously the Olympic virtual series is going to help um, yeah, us live live those values out. Um, and obviously it can help boost participation in cycling. I think, you know, I think we're probably going to agree. The more people we can get on a bike cycling, whether it's road, track, mountain bike, or virtually, the better. Absolutely. It's, um, you know, the life that we, we are navigating through now the post-COVID-19 world, <clears throat> we're really focusing on um, economics, we're really focusing on the environment, and there's a huge focus on health and welfare. And cycling, both as a sport and a recreational activity, ticks all those boxes. And you know, here in Australia, we have more than three million people a week ride a bike now, um, <clears throat> which is really, really exciting because one of the things I didn't realise when I retired was that, and why I struggled to re-engage with riding my bike afterwards was I've never recreationally participated in sport. I've always been about a national title, world title, an Olympic title, um, beating my sister, whatever it is, there's something there that I want to try and achieve out of it. And so I had to learn how to enjoy the just cause factor. And now that I'm a mum and I want to you know, really encourage my daughter <clears throat> to be physically active, to go outside and, and do all those sorts of things, I've really started to appreciate both the inspiration that competitive athletes can offer, but also the, the encouragement to be physically active um, when there really is a just cause factor. Um, and just cause sometimes isn't just for yourself. You need it, you, sometimes you need to you know, be inspired for other people. And, and for me, that's been my daughter. And just cause, just that was saying, just because, that's that's the the idea. Yeah, 
Yeah, simple as that. Yeah, cool. And what, what, so inspiring young girls, let's say, what can, what can people do to help inspire and get you know, young girls to take up cycling and stay involved in the cycling? Because traditionally, a male-dominated sport, I mean, your example of going to the track, and you, it was only you and your sister were the only <laughs> girls. I think a lot of girls probably feel that way um, still. Any, any, any thoughts on, on how we can help nurture more girls into, into the sport and keep them in the sport? Well, that, you know, that phrase that goes around a lot that I've heard, <clears throat> you can't be what you can't see. It's really important um, to have role models. And it's, it's why I love being a role model. You can't pick and choose what you like and dislike um, by being a star in a sport or a successful um, sports person. You've got to kind of take, yeah. take the highs and the lows with it. And I think I have really loved the simple fact that so many young girls, when I was an athlete, have come up to me now um, and said, because of you, I'm riding a bike, or because of you, I've, um, you know, I've really knuckled down into my studies. It's, it's. I look forward to the day that we don't need female role models, um, and we don't have that precursor: women in something, women in sport, women in business, yes. whatever it is. Yep. But until we come to that time, we need those people. Um, yep. How do we encourage girls to take up riding, to stay in riding? You've got to have the opportunity, the starters. Um, you've got to make it fun. It's got to be inviting. Um, and we need to shatter some stereotypes around. And some of the things that I found challenging when I came into the sport was <clears throat> being aggressive and intimidating as a female athlete was kind of frowned upon. Whereas I was looking at some of the great male sprinters and it was applauded. Um, and so I think we need to really start encouraging um, the traits that are required for success and survival in a competitive environment, but encourage the psychological skill of learning how to switch it on and switch it off for, you know, when you're not in that environment. Yep, got it. That makes sense. A um, couple of questions here from one of your old coaches. Um, oh. Yeah, Martin Barris. Oh, you've been speaking to Mom. <laughs> <laughs> so he's now um, performance director at uh, Bike New Zealand, yeah. um, and Greg, Greg Henderson. He's um, so he fed me a couple of questions. So I've got four, I think it's four questions. Here I'm from, really uh, from nervous Martin. now. So just, 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 just chuck these in. Chuck these in. Okay. Um, on the face of them, they're not too well. There's nothing too, too, too bad here. Um, it depends how honest you want to be with your answers, maybe. But uh, any, any rituals or habits before a race? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I always wore black socks for time trialling. Um, even as a okay. sprinter, I wore ankle socks, so you never saw them. Um, but I always wore black socks for time trialling. I always painted my nails with the Australian flags because my first international win as a junior, I did that. And so I was like, I'm doing that at every international race going forward. Um, and I always went through the same preparation routine. My bag was packed in an immaculate way. I could go into it blind and know exactly where it was, but I always wore makeup and I always did my hair. And Marv will find this funny, which is why he's asked you the question, because he couldn't understand why the girls in his team did that. Um, he thought we, they, he thought I, I think he thought we were a bit prissy and a bit diva-ish in doing so. But I, I said to Marv, I said, but if I look good, I feel good. If I feel good, I go good. And when I go good, I'm ready for the photo after I win because I'm all prepared nice. for that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. After I explained that to him, he was the one that would delve into my bag and get my touch-up makeup bag and my brush <laughs> um, for after I won my races. So, yeah. So w w would you say, are you superstitious then? I guess going back with, with the nails. Oh, I don't know if I'm superstitious or I've got an element of OCD in me. Um, got it. Which I'm struggling with in life after sport and my, my partner, Nick, now, he just always tells me to, to chill out. That's a polite way of how he tells me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, you had big rivalries with Natalie Tillinskaya and uh, obviously Brit Victoria Pendleton. Um, two big, big rivalries that spanned quite, quite a long period of time. What was similar, what was different about those two, two rivalries? Oh, um, what was similar was that they were the best in the world at the time when I clashed with them. Um, and they made me better because I wanted to win. 
Um, I understood that they weren't going to get worse. So if I wanted to beat the best, I had to make the changes in order to not just be competitive but win the competition. Um, and I think that's why over such a long period of time I had such um, consistency in my performances because even though I, I'm like a lot of people, I don't like change, but I was open-minded to the need for it to stay ahead in the competition, so to speak. Um, so that's what I would say was the same about them. What was different was they were just completely different specimens, I guess you could say. Um, and by that I say, if, if I could compare them as cars so that people understand how you kind of look at sprinters. Natalia Silenskaya um, was just your big, powerful acceleration muscle car, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know? It was just, you had to be the first to make the move to try and get a little bit of speed up before she'd get her acceleration underway. And you really had to dig deep to the finish line to try and have a chance of winning. Whereas Vicky Pendleton, her acceleration wasn't as good, but her top end speed was phenomenal. Like it was just unchallengeable. Um, comparatively, I might have gears one through five as an acceleration sprinter, she had gears two through six. Now, <clears throat> that's not saying that she was a poor acceleration athlete. That was just how I can explain the difference between the two of us. Um, and so, still in Sky, I would try and keep the race as short and as fast as possible. Um, sorry, as long and as painful as possible, whereas Pendleton, I would try and yes. keep it as short and as fast as possible so that it benefited me. And how can you control that? I mean, people from the outside, you could look at it. You're going around this velodrome and you're trying to influence another rider's sprint. Just give us insight into some of the tactics and the goings on there. Yeah, it's, um, you have to have a really, you have to almost exude this confidence of body language, of, um, like I said before, aggression and intimidation. You can actually win a race before you get on the track, if that is the game that you're prepared to play. Um, and then once you get on the track, essentially what happens is, both parties are trying to negate the other's strength so that they can complement their own, which is why a lot of people call it cat and mouse or a game of chess on wheels. And it's also why a lot of people ask me, why is it called the sprint when you go so slow? <laughs> um, and that's simply because in certain sprint matchups, it benefits me better if I can go slow. So. Um, for example, against Vicky Pendleton, I was a much more physical rider because I tried to physically pin her in, in places where she couldn't get the speed up. And it's a really frustrating um, athlete to come up against for Vicky Pendleton. Like, I would just be an absolute frustration to her. Um, but that's the only way that I could beat her because she was that good. Yeah, and unreal. So that, that, and, you know, 100 meters to go, you're both flat out, you're both neck and neck, you see each other bump in, you're touching, obviously nerves of steel, you know, because you're wearing a tiny sheet of lycra. Oh, yeah. Was that ever a factor? Were you ever nervous about a fearful of, of crashing or? No, well, I had a very big fall um, in the lead up to the Beijing Olympic Games. It was about seven months yes. out at a World Cup in Los Angeles. I had a very, very big fall. And ultimately I broke my neck. I fractured um, my C2 vertebra, which is the second down from the skull. Now I had a lot of fear and doubt to overcome mentally and emotionally, not just to get back competing again, but to <clears throat> have the confidence and, and trust in my skill and, and the environment that I got so hurt in. You know, kind of like when, when you burn your hand on a pot, you're gonna check it a couple of times next time when you go back. Yes. Yeah. And it took me a few goes to, to recompute um, my mind to allow my body to, to go back and function. So fear is a really crippling factor in a speed-based sport like track sprinting mm. because as soon as you show fear, your opponents will absolutely jump on it. And, yes. and I would jump on fear if I got a whiff of it from any of my opponents. Um, I remember, if I go forward now to the Olympic Games in London in 2012, where I met Vicky Pendleton in the final, and I remember sitting on that start line riddled with anxiety and pressure and expectation and shaking like you wouldn't believe and just trying to 
take deep breaths and, and swallow the, the whatever was left in my mouth. It wasn't much of moisture, I was so dry. <laughs> um, and I never want to experience that again, but I'm so glad that I did because I think without Vicky, I wouldn't have been as good as I, an athlete as I was. And if it wasn't for each other, we wouldn't have put a, such a spotlight on women's track sprint cycling as was there in London 2012. Um, and that's something that I'm very, very proud of. Um, and if, you know, if we were able to showcase our sport in a positive way, that draws people into the next Olympic cycle and the next Olympic cycle. And maybe on the virtual platforms, they go, hey, are you the Aussie that raced that Brit? And, <laughs> and I'm like, yep, I am. And they're like, cool, I just beat you. Um, and I'm like, good for you. <laughs> well <done>. yeah. <laughs> no, awesome, awesome. Um, Anna, your, your sister, Kerry, you've mentioned her a couple of times. Yeah. Um, she was also a world-class cyclist, and you had, you had rivalry with her um, on, on the track on occasions. How does it feel to kind of race against your sibling? You know, you, you kind of race fierce competitors, then you come off and it's kind of like, oh, we're, we're sisters, that's, that's nice. <laughs> How, what, 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 what was that relationship like? Oh, look, it was the best feeling when I could beat my sister, I won't lie. It was just <laughs> the best. You had bragging rights, yeah. you just... Yeah. But at the same time, the sister in you felt bad because mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what a lot of people don't know, you know, Kerry and I, you know, we had a, a big rivalry, like you said, and Kerry was very successful early on. You know, she was a dual Commonwealth Games gold medalist, a world medalist as well. And very much one of those women who set the benchmark and broke a lot of glass ceilings for those that followed after her. And um, I'll give you an example. She, she got injured leading into Athens where only one female track sprinter for Australia could go. So up until that point, we were contesting against each other for that one spot. So it wasn't just a matter of being the best in our family. Oh. It was a matter of being yeah. the best in the country. Oh. Um, and when she got injured, it was really heartbreaking because as a sister, I wanted to desperately be there to support her. But days later, I got on the plane, you know, and I left her behind mm. and she had to watch that on TV. <clears throat> I, I don't think I really appreciated at the time how difficult that would have been and was for her. And then you go yeah. forward to Beijing when I got injured <clears throat> again. There was one spot for a female sprinter for Australia in Beijing. We didn't have equal opportunity of events at the time um, as women compared to the male men. Um, we only had the individual sprint. Um, that obviously would change come London. The IOC were very big on ensuring that the, the men's to women's events ratios became even where it, it did. It became five and five, which was wonderful to see and it still yes. continues that way. But in 2008, again, Kerry and I were contesting against each other and other women in Australia for that one spot. I mentioned earlier I had that big accident and I, I broke my neck seven months out from the Games. And I'd done enough prior to that crash to qualify one position for Australia. And I had to perform a fitness trial four and a half months after that accident. And I was the only person asked to perform that fitness trial. If I passed, I went to Beijing. If I didn't, the next in line would go. And what many people don't know, that person was Kerry. And so... Wow. For me to work as hard as I did to ensure my dream becoming a reality, basically I, I was the factor stopping my sister achieving hers. And that's yeah. the emotional baggage sometimes that, that comes with that. I'm lucky that I'm the baby of a family because I have been competing against them all my life. Um, I'm also lucky that Carrie was very much and still is to this day a very protective um, big sister. And nice. I'm lucky that you know, she was able to go through that and still have love for me. <laughs> Good yeah. honour. Yeah. Bless it. Oh. What about your, you mentioned at the start, your older brother who kind of got you on onto, into BMX in. Did he go anywhere with BMX in? Did he? Yeah, did well, he, all, how far did he go? all four kids, uh, we were all national champions in BMX in our age disciplines. Wow. Um, after BMX, my brother chose karate. Um, and my big, <laughs> big brother and big sister were black belts, so Scott and Tracy got to black belt. Kerry and I got to brown belts. Um, by that stage, Scott and Tracy were old enough to move on to work and career aspirations, and it was just Kerry and I left yep. at home, which is why in 1994 we were watching the Com Games on TV, and we were inspired by track cycling for the first time. Wow. So if, if your older brother 
chose karate before BMX, you could have been a, a karate Olympian. I know. Or something else instead. <laughs> you could have been, you'd been fighting your sister and all that. Well, I tell you well. what, now that BMX is in the Olympics, that was also on the cards. And, and many great cyclists um, across many different platforms have come from BMX, like Robbie McEwen, obviously, a yeah. great sprinter for Australia was a BMX bandit as a kid. And I guess through the 80s, many people were BMX bandits, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Olympics, World, World Cups, you've got kind of that natural, I guess, hierarchy with Olympics at, at the peak. How did you view each of those competitions, um, yeah, in relation to each other? The Olympics was always outright number one. It is the pinnacle of track sprint cycling. Um, you can, as an endurance rider on the track, cross over to the road. It's very difficult as a specialised track sprinter to cross over. Um, so it was always outright number one. Um, in terms of where it sits ranking-wise of its events, it would go Olympics, Worlds, World Cups, Com Games, Nationals. But in terms of its importance as Australians, the Commonwealth Games actually comes up pretty high. Um, as a Commonwealth nation and our opportunity to showcase ourselves, our sports um, and to gain exposure um, was really, really important that those Commonwealth Games um, were a priority. So um, I was lucky enough to compete at four Commonwealth Games, win eight Commonwealth medals, five of those were gold. Um, achievements that I'm very, very proud of. But also I've seen in my time, um, you know, equality come into the sport as well. We've seen. I saw the event calendar become even. We got equal prize money um, in 2009, men to women. Um, prior to that, my world championship gold was worth less than a male bronze. Um, you know, so it's nice to see those equalities come through, but also I'm very thankful for the women before me and the generations of past because without them, I wouldn't have had those chances. Absolutely. Obviously, you've, you've paid, uh, played a role there for the next generation as well. Yeah. Um, so, look, pat on the back to you as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, just, just stepping through each of the Olympics, uh, Anna, you know, 2004, Sydney, was your first Olympics. Uh, Athens. You won a gold. Athens, sorry. Athens. Uh, you, you won a gold, gold medal. Boom. You've arrived. And that was in the 500 metre time trial? Yes. So, and then stepping on then four years later, that event that you're reigning Olympic champion in, gone. Gone. Gut-wrenching. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, I'm all for the addition of sports in the Olympic Games. It's a shame that others have to suffer for the inclusion of new sports, especially when others like swimming have so many events and continue to yes. have events added. There's a obviously a, a frustration there with that. Um, in some ways, in hindsight, it's kind of cool because I still hold the Olympic record that I rode on that day as a young 20 year old in 2004. Um, but at the same time, I just really loved the opportunity to showcase um, my skills in that event, which it was my pet event, the time trial racing against the clock at the time. Um, you know, at that, at that pinnacle level, um, it's, it's really tough to then have to put all your eggs in one basket that, look, I wasn't too shabby at the sprint. I won it in 2012, but it wasn't my best event. Um, but maybe because it wasn't my best event is why I worked so hard to make it my best event. And it took me eight years uh, between that gold in Athens yeah. to that very memorable gold um, in London against Victoria Pendleton. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those events that, you know, you think the 500 meter time trial, like, like the team pursuit has been seen, it's very controllable, very measurable, you kind of know where you're at. If there were, ever was a, a banker event, that was it, and you, you were world class at it. You know, you were the world, world, world record, reigned Olympic champion, that could have been, um, yeah, a couple, of, a couple more Olympic medals to your, to your name, but as I say, it wasn't, wasn't to be, and you done it anyway. You went on and <laughs> carried on winning medals in other, in other, other disciplines. And that, that kind of adapting your, you know, adapting as a rider, um, you, you were forced to do it. How, what, what was that process like? Was it kind of, you know, when the news was released, sit down with the coach thinking, right, what are we gonna do? How do we do this? In practical terms, so the next day, training-wise, where do you start? 
reinvented yourself. Yeah, it's um. Look, I think the best way I can describe it is that there's a level of grief and loss and all of the emotions that come along with it. Now, I'm not saying that I lost the life of someone, but grief is, is experienced and interpreted by situational response by everyone at an individual level. And I had to firstly overcome the shock and then overcome the frustration and the anger and then deal with, um, you know, nutting out all the emotion of how I was going to go forward and, and what needed to change. And um, I can guarantee you, it, was, it took me a long time to let that emotion go. Um, and it probably was stemmed by fear of now I only have one shot. And it yeah. already was under pressure. You, you think about you have one chance every four years to get an event right that lasts for 33 seconds, <laughs> yeah. right? You, yeah. you stuff up the start, you, you, you um, hesitate, you um, don't take the black line, which is the, the, the fastest, shortest route around the track. You slip yep. a wheel, whatever the case may be, something might cost you one thousandth of a second. Now, track sprint cycling goes down to one one thousandth of a second. And I've yeah. seen races won and lost by that measurement. And if, if you're listening to this and you don't know what that measurement is distance-wise, it is the width of a lead pencil line drawn on a piece of paper. And <laughs> when it costs you that four-year preparation, it's gut-wrenching. So the time trial to me was just, it was all about that perfection, which the Olympic Games is all about, you know, higher, faster, stronger, um, further, faster, stronger. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it took a lot for me um, to come around to that. But at the same time, it was my accident seven months out from Beijing that really shifted me mentally and made me a better athlete because, firstly, you don't realise what you've got until the rug's pulled out from under you or someone takes it from you or something happens that you don't have the control of that. And I was kind of really confronted with answering some really hard questions. And the first one was simply, is it worth it? Um, <clears throat> is every day of pain, physical, mental, emotional, financial stress that I'm putting on myself and my family, is it worth it? Because I was two millimeters from a complete break at C2 level um, when I fell. And I had to answer that question for me and myself alone. And it's really hard to do that when you have loved ones and lots of opinions coming at you um, to hear your own heart loud enough um, for that. So once I worked out where my passion lied, with that it was worth it, then I started to really knuckle down to the simple breakdown of how do I make this happen? They're not gonna shift the start of the Beijing Olympic Games to accommodate my injury. I now, I now have to walk a completely yeah. different path and plan to make that goal happen for me. And so I really um, had to do a lot of hard work, but in that rehabilitation and seven month um, plan that my team put together for me, I learned so much about myself. I learned that I was functioning far within my best capability. I learned a great deal about my strengths and my weaknesses. I had to have some really hard and honest conversations with myself, with my coaches, with my psychologists, to the point where I realized when I got to Beijing and, and all was said and done and I won a silver medal, I thought to myself, if I just go four more years and apply all the things that I have learned with the focus that I have been you know, afforded in this period, I, I don't know what I can actually do. And that excited me. Excited, yeah. Yeah, really, really excited me. And so that was enough. The, the defeat in Beijing wasn't at all a factor in recommitting that four year cycle. It was simply the, the fact that I, I knew I could be so much better. And post accident, I won nine of my, my 11 world titles. And I think that says it all. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny how you say, you talk about your defeat in Beijing. I mean, you won an Olympic medal. <laughs> <laughs> and you call oh, it a defeat. I know, amazing. I know. But sadly, in the sprint, you've got to lose a race to win, win a silver. And um, yeah. I think, in hindsight, my silver medal I won in Beijing is my greatest achievement. On par with that gold in London. Um, and carrying the flag for Australia in Rio. But um, yeah, it's, it's tough because we as athletes 
put success in as winning and the public put success in gold medals that sometimes it, it, we forget how hard it is to be number one and how many people can test to be number one that we devalue the silver, the bronze, the final, the making of the team. Um, yeah. yeah, and that gets harder the more success that you gain. That's, a, that's amazing. So potentially your, your silver in Beijing was your greatest sporting moment or some achievement. Are you honestly saying that was better than stuffing the Brits and going to <laughs> in London? Oh, Come on, you can, you can be honest. That was pretty sweet. I've got to say that was pretty yeah. sweet. <laughs> Look, Australia um, only won seven, and I say that only, but we had a pretty high standard. We won 20 gold medals in Athens. In London, yeah. we won seven. And the only track cycling gold medal, the only tr cycling gold medal for Australia was that sprint medal against Victoria Pendleton. And the rivalry was so intense, not just on the track, yeah. but off it. Like all the Aussies abroad in London, like the love that I got because they could finally go back to work and serve something up to their British counterparts. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah, like, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was really absolutely. cool. Yeah. Was that that rivalry on the track between the Brits and the, and the Aussies being it's going on going on forever? It seems to be well, we kind of oscillate between who's on who's on top. It's normally generally, um, and obviously the Brits have been on top probably from Beijing up until probably still 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 now. Yeah. What's the sense in, in Australia with that? I mean, you just you just really hate us all, or, <laughs> or they're just that, that that desire just. Uh, no. <laughs> where, where, where are you at with that? Uh, look, it's, um, it's, it's the nature of sport in that I think it was, a, it, it was is a golden age for British cycling. Yes. Um, yes. And it's amazing that it showcases what can happen when you have the funds to support programs to get results. So money doesn't buy results but money can buy the support for the athletes in order to focus to deliver those results. And sport is a, yeah. is a performance-based industry. And, and here in Australia, if we don't get results, we don't get funding. We get funding cuts. Yeah. Um, and it's already hard as it is as an Olympic athlete to, to make ends meet here in this country. Um, and, oh, you know, yeah, you're frustrating as hell when you turn up the Olympics and you just clean sweep everything. It's, um, but, hats off to you because you're good enough to do it it's it's our problem to try and resolve to be better yeah yeah because certainly as, as a Brit you know the you've seen it the worlds before the, the Olympics you, know, you might have world championships in February or something and the Brits do okay and then four months later that kind of, we win loads of medals and you know, I'll stop rubbing it like, in I'm always, am I'm always <laughs> amazed <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is uh, amazing. And it's, it's good to show that, you know, certainly in, in, in Britain, it's, it's all about the Olympics. Oh, absolutely. You know, the Olympic cycle. And that's, that's where the funding is. Yes, it all you, comes back to you that. have the ability uh, to focus on that, whereas other nations need those checkpoint competitions to be able to secure yeah. the funding um, for performances to go forward. And <clears throat> look, I can't complain. I was a part of an era in Australian sport that and, um, was and yeah. is still well funded. but. Um, nearly every nation probably compared to the Brits funding in the last few Olympic cycles is just, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite contrasting. Yeah, sure. So what, what are you up to now? Um, you're happy retired, no sign of a comeback or anything? Oh God, no. I've no, had my fill no. of competition. Like I, I shy away from competition like you wouldn't believe. Like anything really? that puts me in an environment where I feel stress or pressure, I tend to shy away from, which is... is I've got to really work on that, but put me in a board game with anyone. Like, I want to flip <laughs> tables. Um, the competitive side really comes out. But, um, you know, I haven't always been happy in retirement. The transition and change, and many people are probably <clears throat> able to, you know, um, connect with this in that big change, whether it's the end of a career, dealing with a world pandemic, losing a job, losing relationships. Um, it's a really big adjustment. It's a really big adjustment. And I really struggled with that adjustment. I found life after sport, even being prepared for it, <laughs> very challenging. What I did find was no one got me ready for how I would mentally and, and emotionally feel about that loss. Um, 
I don't miss training, but I miss going to training. I miss having somewhere to go every day. I miss my team. I miss that like-minded environment of positive, driven people. Um, I, I miss racing. Racing was the one thing that got me through, which is why I'm excited about the Olympic Games um, going ahead this year, because it just, <clears throat> I, I get a bit, you know, goosebumpy now just thinking about what those athletes yeah. must be thinking and feeling. But um, I've worked really hard on understanding that transition, why I've struggled to let it go, why I've struggled to settle into life. Um, and in the on the other side of it, I, I've done some really amazing things that have fed my soul, so to speak. I, I did a, uh, a bit of a time becoming a foster parent, um, dealing for children between the age of four and eight on an emergency care basis that were taken from their homes, which is amazing because you get dropped off with a young four-year-old at midnight who you've never met before, who's emotionally distressed. Man, put me on an Olympic final any day in front of millions of people. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of the things that I learnt in sport were able to help me help that young child. and. Um, yeah, I've been able to work a lot in charity. Um, unfortunately, my coach, Gary West, who I worked with for 10 years, was um, we lost him to motor neuron disease after Rio in 2016. Um, so I work with a, um, a charity in that regard um, and a lot of you know, young kids' charities as well. And I've also dabbled in um, you know, just different things like commentary of, of cycling. Also things that I love like pottery and art and um, and obviously now that I'm a mum, family life takes priority so um, yeah life's busy, it's busy but it's fun. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> good, glad, glad to hear it. And you just mentioned there and about the excitement of competition that you still get goosebumps and that kind of still really excites you which, which is amazing and I think that's an example of what our listeners can experience through the Olympic virtual series events. You know, they can mix with their heroes through virtual sports. Um, you know, we can all get goosebumps this uh, this summer. We, we missed it all last year. It should have been Tokyo 2020. Um, Tokyo 2021 is here for, for everyone, not, not just the world-class athletes at the actual Olympics, but uh, you know, with the Olympic virtual series, we can all get a sense of that Olympic fever. Yeah, the, the one thing the Olympic Games does it brings people together and unfortunately because of COVID um, we're going to struggle to do that but the Olympic virtual series is going to be a platform that no matter where you are in the world um, you can come together you can ride together and if you really want to look as a Brit you can you can heckle me if you want to come and ride with me so <laughs> I'm happy to take that on. <laughs> right, that's, that's a call to arms every Brit European jump on Anna's rides there. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But uh, Anna, it's been lovely, lovely chatting with you um, across so many aspects. Um, yeah, being a genuine pleasure. Um, yeah, nice talking and all the best and with being a mother. Thank you very much.
to live. 